Thank you. Thank you indeed. And welcome to Scripture and Tradition. I'm Father Mitch Packwell. And this is where we study uh, Scripture in light of Catholic tradition and uh, our own background. And um, if you have any questions or comments for the show, we want you to tell us. Uh, you can email us or go online to our Facebook or YouTube pages. Or you can call us during the live broadcast, which is on Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And the phone number in North America is 1-800-221-9460. 1-800-221-9460. Or if you are outside North America, it is 205-271-2980. All right, we are continuing toward the end of session two in the book called Saved, a Bible Study for Catholics. Of course, you can get that book at EWTNRC.com, a religious catalog. It's item T1784. And we're dealing with the questions that a lot of people have and they ought to have about the meaning of salvation. And what, what is that about? And this is um, something that is uh, very important to understand. We've been talking a lot of, uh, in this session about faith and various parts of the um, uh, movement of faith. Uh, but then, one of the things that we concluded last week with is if we have faith, then we also have an obligation to share it. This is very important. We believe that Scripture is the Word of God and not just uh, a book of philosophy. I, uh, I love philosophy. I majored in philosophy, and I thought it was wonderful. I didn't go into it thinking it might be very wonderful, but the more I studied it, the more I enjoyed it. But I don't feel the kind of dynamism. I've got to preach, you know, the, the, the writings of Aristotle or else. You know, that's good stuff. A lot of other philosophers. I especially studied uh, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, and you know the great, great stuff in his philosophy. But that doesn't compel me. Whereas the Word of God is about more important things ultimately. And so here's something that we have to understand. Now, when we are dealing with the Word of God. We also have to keep this in mind. Not only does it impel us to proclaim the word, but we are also dealing with a set of mysteries. Now, a lot of times people will remember how the sisters used to say, well, that's a mystery. You'll understand it better in heaven. Right? Some of you had the sister. Yeah, see, they remember. And, and that was a way just to keep class moving because some kids would just get us stuck on one issue and uh, avoid getting to the test coming up in the next period. <laughs> but um, there is a lot of mystery here. And I'd like to refer to something that St. Paul wrote to a man that had been his assistant Timothy, and when Paul moved on from Ephesus in Asia Minor, today it's in Turkey, Kadashi in Turkey, but it used to be Ephesus, he left Timothy behind as the bishop. And he went to Jerusalem, Paul went to Jerusalem in 58, and wrote to Timothy probably in the early 60s, probably in the early 60s. Uh, while Luke was still with him. And he wrote two epistles to, to Timothy. And I'd like to cite 1 Timothy, his first epistle. 1 Timothy 3, 16, where he wrote, Without 
any doubt, the mystery of our religion is great. Notice how he starts off calling this a mystery. So it's not my idea, it's in Scripture. He, that is Jesus Christ, was revealed in the flesh, vindicated in spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among Gentiles, believed in throughout the world, and taken up into glory. This is a summary statement. It's a, a, a very early creed if you will. And he calls that the mystery of our religion. Now, this idea of faith being a mystery is very important. Now, before we get to the issue of why is our faith such a mystery, let's see that it's not just that one line in St. Paul. It is something that occurs uh, uh, elsewhere in the scriptures. For instance, in Daniel chapter 2, verse 27 to 28, and, Daniel, and then also verse 47, Daniel is speaking to the king of Babylon and says to him, No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or diviners can show to the king the mystery that the king is a asking. So he uses the word mystery again. A mystery had been revealed to him in his dream. So they can't show the mystery that the king is acting, asking, but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. And after Daniel explains the dream to him, the king said to Daniel, truly, your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries. For you have been able to reveal this mystery. Now, Daniel himself had said, I, I don't know the answer, but God does. So I want to have that sense. Now, why does he say that God is a revealer of mysteries? Why does he talk about that? Well, um, we, we see that God, first of all, I have to understand who God is. And in fact, for the Babylonians, the gods were themselves often as limited and confused as human beings. When you read Babylonian mythology, which, again, I would urge you to do, you can get copies of various uh, myths of the Babylonians online, like the Enuma Elish, for instance, and a variety of others. You can also get them in books. Uh, James Pritchard uh, has a complete, pretty complete, not totally complete, but pretty complete co collection of Babylonian and Egyptian and Assyrian and all these other uh, countries nearby. He has all that laid out. And you see that their gods were very limited in their knowledge. They didn't know always. As a matter of fact, in the uh, Epic of Gilgamesh, during the fl Great Flood, they also, that's where you see the flood told in Tablet 11 of the Epic of Gilgamesh. And you see that the gods were out of control of the flood, and some of them had tricked the majority of them and saved uh, one man and his family and, and slaves and put them in a boat with animals, right? Not like this with Noah. And, you know, the, but the other gods didn't know. The, the same thing is true of the Greek gods and the Roman gods. They are tricking each other, lying to each other. They can do a lot of the worst of the human behavior that we see only because they are gods. Nobody can punish them. And they don't know very many mysteries. They really don't. Whereas the Lord God of Israel is understood to be infinite. He is without limit. No one can trick him. No one can lie to him. There are no other gods who can trick him. 
that he is sovereign Lord. And because he is infinite, there are no, which means there are no limits to God. That's what infinite means. What he reveals are about things concerning himself and his own infinity. And these infinite mysteries are inherently beyond the ability of the finite human mind to comprehend. This is key. Our minds are limited. Our minds are finite. And no matter how much we study, my father had told me this back when I was a very small boy, that the more you learn, the more you realize how little you know. And the older we get, the more we find that to be true. And that's true for science. Science is constantly discovering things, but also learning that a lot of their theories are very limited, and they're still trying to figure out a lot of different things. It's, and it's a constant process. Science doesn't stop and say, okay, now we know it all. They thought about doing that back in the 1890s. They figured that since they knew all the, uh, uh, almost all the elements of the periodic table of elements in chemistry, and since they figured out the speed of light, they figured, well, I don't know what people are going to do for dissertations in physics because we now we know everything. No, we don't. They were just starting to open up stuff because it's very, but those are still finite mysteries. The universe is finite. It's not infinite. It's not e e eternal. The universe had a beginning called the Big Bang, which was all of light an explosion of pure light. I think the universe was somewhere around the size of a baseball or something. Everything was in that small thing, and it blew up and became the universe. And we're learning about that, and we're understanding these things, um, and seeing that the Bible was right, and saying that in the beginning God said, let there be light. Well, that's what the first thing was. It was light, pure light. But it's still finite mysteries of the universe. Whereas God is beyond the universe. He is beyond it in time because he has no time. That's a mystery. He is beyond it in space that there is you know, an infinite infinity of God beyond the whole physical universe. Well, some people say that there are other universes. Maybe so. I don't know. I don't believe it till I see evidence of it. But I don't say that it can't be. I don't know. But even if there were other universes, they would still be like that small baseball in God's eyes. They're just that, that small. So this, we can assert that God is infinite. But our minds are finite. That's why these are mysteries. And we can understand a lot. God has put reasonableness into the universe. The universe has laws of physics, laws of chemistry, the, the, uh, the table of the elements are elements everywhere in the universe. You know, these are all over the place. That This is very, very good. But, um, and our mind is rational and can understand the rational structure. The more we study science, the more rational the universe seems. We keep finding new irrationalities or non-rationalities, but we keep on seeking to understand it better and better. That's, the, that's a great thing about science. In all, from the, the microcosmic, not just microscopic, but subatomic, all the way to the cosmic, and everything in between. We love to study it. But 
we are still dealing with mysteries of God and they are perplexing. And that is not bad. What is it that motivates scientists to keep doing research? They don't understand something and they want to. This is a great human drive to want to comprehend. But with God, it is an infinite object of our intellect. And we will always have questions that drive us to keep seeking to understand God. The superficial people give up that quest, call themselves agnostics, which is a Greek word, agnostos. And what does that mean? Ignorant. <laughs> These are folks who brag about being ignorant. Now, I, I don't have a lot of admiration for that. They, they think it sounds better if they use a Greek word instead of a Latin word, but it's still ignorance and they're proud of it. Um, no, 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 no. We, we want, we, we take this on. And then atheists, some of them will call themselves atheists because uh, they don't like God. But, you know, we want to deal with this mystery. And some of the mysteries that we have to deal with. Why are there three persons and one God? How do the three persons and the oneness, one nature of God fit together? How is it that one infinite person, God the Son, became flesh? That's a mystery. How is all of infinity encapsulated in the womb of a young girl in Nazareth? Just celebrated yesterday the Feast of the Incarnation. I love it at that, the Church of the, uh, the Annunciation. There's an altar there inside what had been the part of a cave that was Our Lady's house. And in it says, Hic verbum uh, caro factum est. Here the Word was made flesh. That's really cool. And, but it's still a mystery because he becomes finite human being. How and why did he become flesh in the womb of a virgin? Why, why did God incarnate die on the cross? We'll be celebrating that in just a few weeks. What is the resurrected body like? And many, many other mysteries. These mysteries are the content of our faith. This is precisely what we have faith in. That God who sh reveals mysteries to us. But it's not merely a way of getting away from explaining things. Just like the questions posed by science motivate scientists to keep doing more research and not be satisfied with answers that are half-baked and don't really explain the data. Instead, we find that the mysteries of God and the Christian faith open up problems that seem too difficult and yet it's very important that they deal with the meaning of life. They are opening us up to questions that intrigue us about the purpose of life. Is it all here on earth? That's what the superficial go for. This is all you have. This is all she wrote. And it's not that great. I like life. I'm happy to get older, and, you know, but I know I'm going to die someday. How does the inevitability of death and the difficulties of life and the good things in life, how does all of that fit together? And these mysteries of God come into our mind, and as we crave to understand them, we will never be bored. We can solve Agatha Christie novels. For me, I stopped reading mystery novels with the Hardy Boys. So I could solve some of those mysteries and learn the answers to who did it. And then I don't read them again. Whereas the mysteries of God will remain fascinating, not only through this life, but into all eternity. That's why heaven will never be boring for the people of faith. 
Hell, on the other hand, will be tedious from the first second forward. And the tedium will have no end. So um, make up your choice. Make up your mind. Uh, you can celebrate Easter with us in the middle of April. Or if you're an atheist, celebrate on your feast day of April 1st. Since the Bible says, the fool says in his heart there is no God. So they can have their feast day and we'll have ours. All right, we're going to take a break. Be back in uh, just a minute to continue on with some of these aspects of the mysteries of God. And then your questions and comments. Please stay with us. So we've been talking about how the, the Word of God is proclaiming to us a mystery. St. Paul had said that, we already saw, in 1 Timothy 3. And how that these mysteries are necessary because God is infinite. And we will never be able to comprehend all of it. We just can't. And that's okay. And I'd like to continue on showing this from Scripture a little bit more. So let's take a look at something St. Paul wrote in his third epistle, the third one he ever wrote, which was 1 Corinthians 15, 51. We looked at 1 Timothy, which is one of his last epistles. But here in one of his first epistles, 1 Corinthians 15, 51, he wrote, Listen, and I will tell you a mystery. We will not all die, but we will all be changed. Now, he's speaking here and saying, announcing right away, I'm telling you a mystery. And he's talking about the resurrection of the dead. And he's saying, he'll go on to explain, mm. people who have already died will be raised up. But those who are still alive at the second coming of Christ, which Paul expected to see, they will be transformed in body. And then we can take a look at um, Romans 11, verse 25, where he says, So that you may not claim to be wiser than you are, brothers and sisters, I want you to understand this mystery. A hardening has come upon part of Israel until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. So he's dealing with another mystery. Why have the Jewish people not fully embraced Christianity and Christ? That was a mystery to him. And, and remains so to us to this day. We see also in the same letter, and again, remember, Romans was written just about four years after 1 Corinthians. It was written in the spring of 58 AD. And he wrote in Romans 16, verse 25, Now to God, who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but is now disclosed, and through the prophetic writings is made known to all the Gentiles, according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Now, Let's take a look at that. 
because he says here that the mystery is revealed. Does that mean that everything is clearly understood? No. But what you do in a mystery is you lay out different aspects and you keep them and maintain the tension of these different points of revelation. Because only as you maintain the tension that God is one God and three persons, the tension that Jesus Christ is truly God the Son from all eternity and truly incarnate man. And you are justified by faith, but also by works. And on and on with these different mysteries. These are tensions. We make them known in as much as God has made it known. And we see that this, these mysteries were foretold by the prophets. So it's not something that St. Paul in the early church was simply making up. The prophet Isaiah had spoken about the Messiah who would suffer and die and be buried among the wicked. Prophet Isaiah had said that he would be born to a virgin and on and on. So we have to maintain all of that and proclaim that um, so that we then bring about an obedience of faith to those mysteries. This is key. This is key. Because we, uh, well, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Just want to give a couple other verses where he speaks of this mysteriousness of God. In Ephesians, which he wrote probably uh, within two years, year and a half after Romans. Um, Ephesians 1, verse 9. St. Paul writes to the Ephesians, God has made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. It is essential to see here that it is God's wisdom and insight to reveal the mystery of Christ's redemption to us. This is extremely important here. And then also in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, he talks again about this issue of the mysteries. He says, this is the reason that I, Paul, am a prisoner for Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. For surely you have already heard of the commission of God's grace that was given to me for you and how the mystery was made known to me by revelation. As I wrote above in a few words, a reading of which will enable you to perceive my understanding of the mystery of Christ. In former generations, this mystery was not made known to humankind as it ha ha now has been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That is, the Gentiles have become fellow heirs, members of the same body, and sharers in the promise of Christ Jesus through the gospel. Here, he's speaking about the mystery that was difficult for the people of Israel to understand that the Gentiles were going to be invited to faith. They didn't understand that very well. But that's the, another mystery that the apostles were sent out to reveal. It was in, in Jesus' own words, but now clearer in the apostles' preaching. And then he continues on in verses 7 to 10 of Ephesians 3, of this gospel, I have become a servant according to the gift of God's grace that was given to me by the working of his power. Although I am the least of all the saints, this grace was given to me to bring the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ 
and to make everyone see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This is uh, something that he repeats many other times. I can go through more of these. But one of the most important is in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Because this is where it applies to us. He says there, this is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Now, the importance of keeping in mind that what God has revealed to us is an infinite mystery is that we have to also understand that we are stewards of that mystery. These are not our own possession. I don't have control of the mysteries of God. Just like a steward or servant does not own his master's property. He serves the master and administers his property with fidelity. And this means that every one of us Christians who is going to minister the mysteries of God and be stewards of the mysteries of God. This is something that we have to keep in mind so that we don't make it a gospel that is defined by me. A lot of times, what we see, including with some of the folks who go door to door in our neighborhoods, is that they preach a gospel that makes more sense than what we preach in the Catholic Church. Why is it? Why is it simpler? Why is it more comprehensible? Because they get rid of the mystery. Jehovah's Witnesses, for instance, will preach a Jesus who is only human. He's only a creature. They can make it more understandable if they destroy the mystery. The same is true with people who say, well, the Mass really is just a way, a, a, a way for us to celebrate that we are a community. If you get rid of the faith that the Eucharist is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, and that community is formed in response to his presence, if you change the mystery, it's easier, but boring. That's why people who teach that lose folks in their congregations. It's too boring. If you get rid of the, the need to not only have faith and do good works on either side, because there are heretics on both sides. Some people say, don't worry about what you believe. Just do things that are good for the poor. Other people say, it doesn't matter what you do, only have faith. Both of those destroy the mystery. And they make a gospel that belongs to them instead of the gospel that Christ gave us. And if we are to be like St. Paul when we preach, we have to keep in mind we are merely stewards of the mysteries. They're not ours. We don't own them. They're greater than we are. And having an obedience of faith to those mysteries is where not only are we going to save our own souls, but when we call people to faith in, in the real God and what he's really revealed and call them to that obedience of faith, as St. Paul calls it, in those mysteries, then they also can find his salvation. 
All right. Now let's pause there and we'll go to a caller. Hello, Susan. Hello. Hi, where are you calling from? Philadelphia. Philadelphia. I have a lot of folks here from Pennsylvania today. What can we do for you? My question um, for you, thank you for listening. My sure. question for you is regarding forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Tying it in somewhat with the mysteries, because it is a mystery to me that God will forgive. And after week after week confessions, um, I, I still don't really feel in my heart I don't know that how I could be forgiven. Mm -hmm. And are other people that have done me wrong going to be forgiven as well, even mm -hmm. if they're not trying as hard as me? Yeah, well, first of all, Susan, one of the things that will not help you is trying to figure out what these other people are doing or not doing. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, stay away from that. Okay. Because this is, see, this is the point at which you meet the Sermon on the Mount. When Jesus, our Lord, said, you know, don't judge or you'll be judged by the same standard. Take the plank out of your own eye. Don't worry about the splinter in your brother or sister's eye. Okay. That, 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 that's a dead end, spiritually. So what you want to do is focus, all right. I've got something, and here's one of the things to keep in mind also. It's not about how you feel necessarily. Are, are you married? Uh, no, divorced. Okay, do, do you have kids? I have a do grown daughter. Okay, when your daughter was growing up, was there any time she ever disobeyed you? Of course. <laughs> of course. And sometimes she might have disobeyed you in very serious ways when you had told her a thousand times, I told you kids. Yeah. At least that's how I heard it from my mother. Yes. Um, and, and you can feel very angry at her. But did that change the fact that you loved her because you are her mother? No, not at all. Not at all. And no matter how you felt at those particular moments, you loved her, yes. right? Yes. And there may have been times where she felt just as angry with you, but she still loved you. Right. That, that, that's, and so here's where we learn, what we learn from that. We have to be very careful not to center on how I feel about something. That's, you know, we deal with the reality and say, all right, Lord, even though I don't feel it, I'm going to trust that you forgive me, just like my daughter trusted that I still loved her, and I trusted that she still loved me, even though we were pretty mad at each other at some points. Right, right. You, you have an act of faith in the love for each other, right? Right. Same thing with God our Lord. So you make that act of faith, and then in terms of the feelings that go on, there is something important. I don't want to dismiss them, but I want to keep them in the proper setting of your faith in what God has done. And that is this, that there may be some hurt that is not necessarily the sin involved. This may not have anything to do with the sin, but it is about the, the feeling, I don't think this person who offended me really understands how much pain he or she caused me. And we sometimes feel very hurt that they don't understand. And we want them to understand. Would that be right? That's what, exactly what I'm feeling. Yeah. I'm and willing here's, to here's one of the points where you come then. You are in the kind of position that Jesus was in as he's hanging on the cross. Everybody's making fun of him and mocking him for not coming down from the cross and all sorts of things. And what I would urge you to do is take a look at Luke 23 
It'd be right around verse 25 or 30. I could find it in a minute. Uh, but where he is on the cross saying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. To take time to reflect on Jesus our Lord saying that, but you realizing to whom he's saying it. Think about what's going on. And the people that he's saying that about, he's saying it to the Father for these other people. And for you to make, you know, uh, to ask for Christ to give you the grace to be able to say that. Because it is a gift. And it's a gift of faith in him to identify with him at that point. And that's one of the things I think that may be able to help you work through this more deeply. Okay? Yes, very much. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. All right. We are going to take a break. And we'll be back with some emails, more of your questions, as well as from our studio audience. So please stay with us. for a few more comments and questions. Ma'am, where are you from? I'm from Michigan. Michigan. And your question or comment? I have a comment and a question. And, and Father, you were talking about Jesus saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And we know the great mystery that came about upon the death of Christ. Mm -hmm. And I look at the world Mm -hmm. the way it is. Mm -hmm. I look at our country the way it is, and the way people think mm -hmm. and should be thinking. And I look at our church and what is happening. Mm -hmm. And I also look at divine mercy when Christ said to Sister Faustina, Jesus, I trust in you. And I say to myself, do we have the faith that it takes to follow directly to the word of Christ and what he taught us. And are we going to be able to hold ourselves together and follow Christ mm -hmm. through whatever mystery might come about? I, I think, you know, you're, you're posing an extremely important problem. Um, human history is filled with various turning points. And often enough, I and mean, you've been around this planet longer than I have, I believe. Not too many more years, but a few years. And you know, you've seen the wrong turns people have made. Uh, were you alive during World War II? Yes. Yeah, and and the wrong turns I've made. Well, there's well there's that too. But even as cultures, you know, society, it's not only individuals, but oftentimes society takes very wrong turns. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we've seen that with communism. We saw it with National Socialism, the Nazis. We saw it with a wide variety of other ideologies that led to widespread death. And we see it in our own country with uh, the, the widespread death of the unborn. Now the aged are targeted as well. And the, the born, now children out of the womb, the governor of New York legalized uh, killing children after they survive an abortion. And governor of Virginia wants to and other states want to. 
Um, these are serious turns uh, of culture. And this is where we have to say to, our, to ourselves, do we think we are going to be following the culture because this is the direction of evolution? Or are we going to follow Christ because this is the way that is right and true? And there's nothing that we are going to do to keep ourselves from doing it. Christ is. Our Lord, we need not only to look to him to give us the way to follow, but we also have to look to him to give us the grace to be able to do what he asks. Like St. Augustine had said, Lord, command whatever you want, but give me what you command. In other words, give me the grace to obey you. And this is where this time of great Lent is so important. Because as we listen to the Gospels and the readings from the Old and New Testaments, we hear again and again those examples of the need to repent. And it's not just a time to give up some chocolates or for some people to think, well, I need to, to lose a few pounds so I can fit into my Easter dress or something. You know, this is something of a time for us to reflect on whether, whether or not by following cultural trends, we are following uh, the father of lies, who's not only a liar, but as our Lord says in the same passage in John 8, Satan is a liar, the father of lies, and a murderer. So those who follow the way of killing other people are following Satan. So it's just that simple. And those who follow truth and life will be following Christ. And we have to make up those, those, our minds on those issues. All right, ma'am, where are you from? Abita Springs, Louisiana. Abita Springs, I know exactly where that is. It's a nice area down there, I like it. And your question? Well, you were saying about how the Gentiles have the same inheritance as the, the Jewish people, the chosen people. Mm -hmm. And I, I was just wondering if you, like if you read the Psalms every day, you see how much God speaks of his chosen mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. Are we still to believe that the chosen, the Jewish are the chosen people mm -hmm. or, or how can we learn anything from them today? Well, there's a lot we can learn from the people of Israel to be sure. Um, that's why we still read the Old Testament. Uh, it's, it's not something extra. We, we say in the creed, at least every Sunday and, and you know, solemnity, that we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and Son, and who spoke through the prophets. You know, this is, so that, that's, that's the word of God. And so we learn a lot from the people of Israel. We learn a lot that uh, as, when you read Deuteronomy, uh, especially chapter 7, you see how the Lord told Moses, I didn't choose you because you were the greatest people, the smartest people, or the biggest people. But I'm faithful to you because I called your fathers. And there is that, un when you take a look at uh, Genesis 15, you see that the promise that the Lord God makes to Abram, seen before he's called Abraham, when he, when he made to Abram, is an unconditional promise. There's no conditions that Later on in Mount Sinai, there are conditions. If you obey the commandments, I'll give you the land. If you don't obey my commandments, I'll drive you out of my land. Fairly simple. But it doesn't mean that he'll, they'll stop being his people, even if they're driven out of the land, which has happened a number of times. So 
this commitment of God to Israel is extremely important, and they remain a, a, a particularly important guardian of those promises and prophecies and the wisdom uh, of the Old Testament. But there's something else in terms of the inheritance. When St. Paul writes about us inheriting eternal life, what do we see? We see uh, that it's because we have faith in Jesus Christ. He is the firstborn of the Father. When we have faith and are baptized, we become members of the body of Christ. That's something that St. Paul learned when Jesus um, uh, you know, uh, was able to, to say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? When he's persecuting the church. So to be baptized is to be part of Christ. And if we are in Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, then we are heirs and co-heirs with Christ. In other words, to inherit the kingdom of God comes because we belong to Christ. The kingdom is given to Christ. We are co-heirs with him because we are adopted children of God. Christ is the only begotten son. We are the adopted children. And this is something that is uh, essential. Now, that's where baptism is absolutely essential. It's not an extra. And it's, it's the way we belong to Christ. So that's the other side of it. Okay? All right. We have Linda calling you from Florida. Yes, Miami. Yes. And what can we do for you? Uh, first of all, I love you, Father. Thank you. And secondly, um, I have, I have, I'm a little confused. Okay. I always learned that um, you, you, um, if you, faith in Jesus Christ will get you to heaven mm -hmm. for his, what He did on the cross. But mm -hmm. then I hear you speak about works, mm -hmm. and then I, I wonder if, how many. <laughs> how do you know if you've done enough works to get to heaven? Ah, wrong question. <laughs> Let's take a look, first of all, at scripture here. James 2, verse 24. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. That's the word of God. And so you don't worry about how many works you do. Because it's not we who determine the worthiness of our own, but rather, God gives us faith by the means of a gift of his grace. But he also gives us the grace of love and the grace to be able to do good works. And all that he asks is that we are faithful to the good works he sets before us and not worry about how many we have to earn in order to get it. That would be the wrong question, but fidelity to what he asks us, that is the right issue. We'll talk more about that as we go through this book. Till then, may the Lord bless you all and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and lead you in all of his ways by his peace. I bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill so we can pay our bills. Thank you.